the subject of today's question and answer session broadly is repentance. Specifically, as indicated in our question list, returning home, sin, repentance, and atonement. The subject of today's question and answer session broadly is repentance. Specifically, as indicated in our question list, returning home, sin, repentance, and atonement. So let's begin with the first question, because as we'll see, there are three questions here, and each is a major set of questions that I must admit came from multiple sources. But um, these are the questions that you raised. I think they certainly warrant a serious discussion based upon what we learned from the Bible. At times, we read in the Bible about sins that condemn sinners to die. When can a sinner still repent and live, and when not? When can we still pray for a sinner, and when not? So, of course, inevitably, in plunging into this discussion, we need to start out with considering just what repentance means. So, undoubtedly, many of you are aware that the Hebrew word for repentance is teshuva. And with respect to just what repentance means, as earlier scholars have noted, we have what seems to us to be a completely unrelated passage in the book of Samuel that provides us with a very cogent definition. It's in the first book of Samuel, in chapter 7, where we read the description of the prophet Samuel as what we would describe as a circuit judge. And Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. And he went from year to year in circuit to Bethel and Gilgal and Mitzvah, and he judged Israel in all those places. Chapter 7, verse 17, and his return was to Ramah, for there was his home. The Hebrew for his return is Teshuvato, his Teshuvah. Now, of course, in context, it doesn't mean his repentance. It means his return. But that essentially is what teshuva means. It means returning home. It means the realization that in this world, we sometimes can wander far away indeed from our true home with God. Teshuva means returning home returning to God. And of course, this theme is one that resonates throughout Scripture. While I'm not going to attempt any kind of exhaustive list, we need to at least consider some examples to dramatize this point. In Psalm 90, verses 2 and 3, before the mountains were brought forth forever, you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So going all the way back to the beginning, you bring man to the crushing point and say, return, you children of men. Even if man has come to the crushing point, that moment of apparent no return, there is return. God summons, remains in perpetuity. Return, you children of men. And throughout the prophets, we read this message over and over again. The first chapter of Isaiah, from verse 16, Wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. And we have specific examples of what that means in practice. Learn to do well, seek justice, relieve the oppressed. Judge for the fatherless, plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, says God. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. It's all up to you. 
It's your choice. Likewise, in Isaiah chapter 55, in verse 7, let the wicked forsake his way and the man of iniquity his thoughts and let him return unto God and he will have compassion upon him and to our Lord, for he will abundantly pardon. In Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 22, return ye backsliding children, I will heal your backslidings. There's God promises to heal, but obviously that in itself is subject to our, to our keeping our part of the bargain. Return, you backsliding children. Same message in Hosea chapter 14, return, O Israel, unto God your Lord, for you have stumbled in your iniquity. Take with you words and return to God. Say to him, forgive all iniquity and accept that which is good. We will consider the end of this verse a little bit later today. But once again, the message in verse 5, I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for my anger is turned away from them. But once again, the anger is turned away because we have done what God summoned us to do. Because we took that first step, return to God your Lord. Of course, again, the extent that we fulfill the part of the deal that God imposes upon us, the promise of forgiveness is likewise ubiquitous in the Bible. A couple of brief examples. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 25. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and your sins. I will not remember. In Isaiah chapter 44, in verse 22, I have blotted out as a thick cloud your transgressions and as a cloud your sins. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. And in the following verse, indeed, the promise, for God has redeemed Jacob and does glorify himself in Israel. In Jeremiah chapter 50, in verse 20, in those days and in that time, says God, the iniquity of Israel will be sought for, and there shall be none, and the sins of Judah, and they shall not be found, for I will pardon them whom I leave as a remnant. And in the final chapter of Micha, in verse 18 of chapter 7, who is a God like unto you, who pardons the iniquity and passes by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retains not his anger forever, because he delights in kindness. He will again have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities, and you will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. You can't help but note that these words of the prophet Micha are read in synagogues throughout the world on the afternoon of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And finally, one last example from the Psalms, from Psalm 86, verse 5. For you, God, are good and ready to pardon, and plenteous in kindness unto all them that call upon you. The promise. God forgives. It's not a carte blanche for us to do whatever we will and then come to God with demands that he forgive us regardless. It is inevitably in response to that relentless summons, return, backsliding children. And God as loving Father is always ready to accept the backsliding children when they return to him. Now, in light of what we've seen on the subject of repentance generally, we, of course, need to consider more specifically the question that pertain to sins that condemn sinners to die, as we saw it in question one. The extent to which sin is indeed lethal. The truth is that we can cite many verses in Scripture that carry that implication. The question is what they mean. That is, for starters, in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 16, the fathers shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. 
every man shall be put to death for his own sin. But that does, after all, imply that one can be put to death, at least for some sins. Obviously, not necessarily for all. The theme of sin being deadly is a recurrent one, in particular in Ezekiel. We see it especially in Ezekiel chapter 3, Ezekiel chapter 18, and Ezekiel chapter 33. Let's consider it in brief. In chapter 3, verse 18, when I say unto the wicked, you shall surely die. And the wicked does not repent of his bad deeds. The same wicked man shall die in his iniquity. We see the self-same expression in verse 19 as well. He shall die in his iniquity. And likewise, even with respect to the righteous man, verse 20, who returns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, he shall die in his sin. We see this theme in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4. The soul that sins, it shall die. And given the portrayal here of the righteous father, the lawless son, and the righteous grandson, we see with, with respect to that wicked son, he shall not live, in verse 13. He has done all these abominations, he shall surely be put to death, his blood shall be upon him. And once again in verse 18, Likewise, with respect to the wicked son, father of the righteous grandson, he dies for his iniquity. Nothing is going to save him. And once again, in chapter 18, in verse 20, the soul that sins, it shall die. Which means that on the one hand, the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, but the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. And this indeed becomes a recurrent theme, again, not only in chapter 18, but also in chapter 33, where we read in, for example, verse 8, when I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, you shall surely die, and he doesn't take heed to the warning, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity. In verse 9 as well, he shall die in his iniquity, and so on and so forth. I think we see this theme sufficiently reiterated to leave no room for doubt concerning it. Finally, as a final example from Proverbs chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, his own iniquities shall ensnare the wicked, and he shall be holden with the cords of his sin. He shall die for lack of chastening, for lack of chastisement, and in the greatness of his folly he shall err stray and be lost. So, are we indeed speaking of the inexorable damnation of sin here? Of course, inevitably, this is a classic example of how selective quotations can be awfully misleading. By no means is that the thrust of the passages that we just read. Just consider as a case in point, Let's first return to Ezekiel chapter 3 and then consider chapter 18 and chapter 33 as well. In chapter 3, where we saw in verse 20 that when a righteous man returns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, he shall die in his sin. Why shall he die in his sin? He shall die in his sin because he refuses to repent. Because he doesn't return, ultimately, from his path of iniquity. And so that path of iniquity is what carries him by his own choice to the grave. As opposed to, in verse 21, if you warn the righteous man who has slipped into sin, that the righteous sin not, in other words, he reverts from that path of iniquity, and he does not sin, he shall surely live, because he took warning, and he repented, 
that is, it is, after all, a veritable truism that if someone chooses a path of iniquity and never turns back from that path, that path will accompany him to the grave with all the consequences in this world and beyond. But that was his choice. He could have returned. He had the opportunity. In Ezekiel chapter 18, even more so, we already noted in verse 4, the soul that sins, it shall die. Yeah, but simultaneously, we also saw the message that emerges when one considers the opportunity to return to God. In verse 23, have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, says God the Lord, and not rather that he should return from his ways and live? Then indeed, in verse 27 as well, again, when the wicked man turns away from his wickedness that he has committed and does that which is lawful, that which is justice and righteousness, he shall save his soul alive. Because he saw and turned away from all his transgressions that he had committed. He shall surely live. He shall not die. And finally again, verse 32, For I have no pleasure in the death of him who dies, says God. Wherefore, return yourselves and live. That's the message of this chapter. Not the inability to escape the dire fate of sin, but on the contrary, the relentless call to return to God. We see this likewise in Ezekiel chapter 33, where on the one hand, again, we noted the verses that speak of sin leading to death, but in chapter 33, in verses 11 and 12, say unto them, as I live, says God the Lord, this is an oath by God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked return from his way and live, return you, return you from your evil ways, and why will you die, O house of Israel? And you, son of man, say unto the children of your people, the righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression, and as for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not stumble thereby in the day that he returns from his wickedness. Neither shall he that is righteous be able to live thereby in the day that he sins. It's all up to you. The opportunity to return to God, certainly as presented in these verses, is unlimited. God is waiting for us to return to him. In his abundant kindness, he has given us this opportunity. He's given what I can only describe as the miracle of repentance. The capacity to turn back the clock. The crimes, after all, were committed you would think that history represents a reality that is immutable. But the miracle of repentance is that God enables us, at least on some level, to rewrite history. And the determinant of our fate is our own choice. Are we going to keep on going in the path of iniquity and take that path with us to the grave or return to God. It's all up to us. And indeed, by way of summation, in Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 19, once again, when the wicked returns from his wickedness and does justice and righteousness, he shall live thereby. There's no death here in this equation. So, of course, at this point, considering the opening question, we read in the Bible about sins that condemn sinners to die. That's true, but that condemnation, that verdict, can still 
be changed by the choices that we make. And so, to that extent, a sinner can still repent and live. And the verses that we've seen then, in particular in Ezekiel, that seem at first brush to be so terrifying, really aren't terrifying at all. On the contrary, they're giving us a sense of just how important our making the right choices is. It's in our hands. Except that, considering the whole picture, there are verses that indicate something very different. And it's important for us to consider these verses because when one internalizes their implications, they really are terrifying. Beginning in Exodus chapter 4, when God bids Moses return to Egypt on the mission that God has given Moses, we read in verse 21, I will strengthen or harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will not let the people go. And that theme of God hardening or strengthening the heart of Pharaoh is one that recurs over and over. In Exodus chapter 7, in verse 3, I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he won't listen. In Exodus chapter 9, God hardened, strengthened the heart of Pharaoh, and he hearkened not unto them. This is an expression that we find explicitly invoked from plague number six, the plague of boils. And on, in Exodus chapter 10, God says to Moses at the beginning of the chapter, I have hardened Pharaoh's heart and the heart of his servants. And likewise, in verse 20, God hardened, strengthened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the children of Israel go. In verse 27, the same expression, God strengthened or hardened Pharaoh's heart. In Exodus chapter 11, in verse 10, once again, God is the one who is hardening or strengthening Pharaoh's heart. And finally, at the sea, God says to Moses in verse 4, I will strengthen Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue after them into the sea. Which, you know, when you think about it, sounds almost insane. Verse 8, and God strengthened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out triumphantly. That is, the insanity of thinking that he was going to be able to vanquish God. And in verse 17, again, God says to Moses, Behold, I will strengthen the hearts of the Egyptians, and they will come in after them. They will effectively cause their own drowning by running into the sea. Do they really think that they'll be able to vanquish God? But God is the one who strengthened their hearts to their own destruction. The theme of God strengthening the heart of the sinner to his destruction is one we also see in Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 30, that Sichon, king of Cheshbon, would not let us pass by him, for God your Lord hardened his spirit and made his heart obstinate, that he might deliver him into your hand, as appears this day. And one final example of hardening, strengthening the heart to the point of destruction. In Joshua chapter 11, we read in verses 19 and 20, there was not a city that made peace with the children of Israel, save the Hevites, the inhabitants of Gibbon. They took all in battle, for it was of God to strengthen their hearts to come against Israel in battle, that they might be utterly destroyed. Now, for the record, we should note that such a fate is one that can also befall the sinners of Israel. In Isaiah chapter 6, granting that the implication of verse 10 is somewhat obscure, and we can render it in more than one way, but perhaps the most straightforward meaning of verse 10 is much the same theme. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they, seeing with their eyes, and hearing with their ears, and understanding with their heart, return and be healed. And they're not going to be able to be healed. Just as 
Pharaoh and Sichon and the various nations that were here in the land of Israel upon whom God had already decreed extirpation could not be healed. So to the sinners of Israel. And in much this vein as well. In the final chapter of the history of Israel, as we read it in Chronicles, Second Chronicles, chapter 36, in verse 15, God, the Lord of their fathers, sent them by his messengers, sending betimes and often, because he had pity on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of God arose against his people till there was no remedy. It's possible, indeed, to reach a point of no return. So, in all of these verses that we just saw, how do we understand that point of no return? Pharaoh, whose heart is hardened or strengthened by God, is incapable of repentance. So too Sichon, so too all the others of whom we read here, including the sinners of Israel. What does that mean in light of what we've already discussed with respect to God extending to us relentlessly the opportunity to return to him. Inevitably, the answer is, there can be a point of no return. Just as death is a point of no return. And if an individual has chosen a path of wickedness, of iniquity, and as we described it earlier, has taken that path with him to the grave, well, Obviously, at that point, he has squandered the opportunity to return to God. Well, there are circumstances, granted extraordinary circumstances, but there are circumstances in which when that entire dynamism has taken place and an individual has taken the path of iniquity with him to the grave and has squandered the opportunity to return to God, he doesn't necessarily immediately die. He has, for all intents and purposes, forfeited his humanity because an essential component of our humanity is our free choice, our ability to choose to return to God. These individuals, starting with Pharaoh and the other examples that we've noted, because of their earlier sins, forfeited their very humanity, forfeited their free choice, forfeited their ability to return to God when the enormity of the divine punishment is already upon them. So when we consider what this means, again, in light of the question, when can a sinner still repent and live and when not? Well, when can a sinner still repent, as long as he's alive. But there can be individuals who, while walking around, talking, breathing, doing all the things that living people do, may in fact not be alive in a spiritual sense. And if we ask how that could be, that can only be by consequence of punishment for what they've already chosen to do. In the case of Pharaoh, as... I noted earlier, it is explicitly only from the sixth plague, the plague of boils, and on, that we read that God strengthened or hardened Pharaoh's heart. And admittedly, in our tradition, there are two possibilities that are advanced. One, that it was Pharaoh's strengthening his own heart in the first five plagues that resulted in divine punishment that God 
then strengthens and hardens his heart for the other five as punishment for his own intransigence in the first five plagues. The alternative is that perhaps really for all ten plagues, even when we read that Pharaoh was hardening his heart, it was coming from God because we read after all, when God sends Moses back to Egypt, he already tells him that. And to understand why Pharaoh's heart was hardened already from plague one, we have only to consider everything Pharaoh had done beforehand. He had already amassed a sufficient ledger of indictment for the crimes that he had already committed, that he already forfeited his humanity, and as a result, was subject to the punishment, irrespective of the otherwise obvious interest that he would have in averting further punishment by repentance, he could not repent because he had already forfeited his humanity, spiritually dead. At that point, he could not repent. In other words, if we could say this by way of summation, there comes a point, inevitably, for each of us when we leave this world behind. And in this vein, in Psalm 88, in verse 6, we read of how when one is considered among the dead, the dead are described as free. Considered among the dead who are free. Free from what? Free from any of the responsibilities that pertain to being alive in this world. And as such, they are cut off from your hand. Similarly, In Psalm 115, in verse 17, the dead praise not God, neither any that go down into silence. As opposed to all of us. So long as you're alive, we will bless God from this time forth and forever. Hallelujah. That, of course, is the mission and opportunity that all those who are alive have. And... Of course, inevitably, the conclusion that this impels us to reach is, while there are indeed extraordinary cases in which God has withdrawn from a person his very humanity, spiritually he's already dead, and as a result, his free will has evaporated, for each and every one of us, as long as we're alive, you certainly aren't going to assume that, For each of us, we are still relentlessly summoned to return to God. We already noted Psalm 90, verse 3. You bring man to the crushing point. In our tradition, this refers to the moment of death. Until that very moment, you say, return, you children of men. God is still extending to us the opportunity, bidding us to seize upon that opportunity in returning to Him. And indeed, even at that moment of death, as we read in Job chapter 13, verse 15, though He slay me, yet will I hope for Him. I continue hoping in God. And even as I realize my life is ending. That continues to represent the summons to return home. Finally, one last component of that first question, which is, when can we still pray for a sinner? And when not? Of course, inevitably, that's a corollary of what we've already seen. We can keep on praying. We should keep on praying to that very last, final moment. I feel compelled to share with you the story in our tradition of one of the rabbis who was beset by really wicked neighbors and, as a result, wanted to pray for their demise until his very wise wife 
pointed out to him the implications of the final verse of Psalm 104. Psalm 104, verse 35. Now, usually we render it as, let sinners cease out of the earth and let the wicked be no more. But she said, the Hebrew, chataim, can be rendered not as sinners, but as sin. So let sin cease out of the earth, and of course, necessarily, let the wicked be no more. Because the moment that sin ceases out of the earth, the wicked are no longer wicked. So, she instructed him, don't pray that they should die, pray that they should repent. And the story ends with the rabbi accepting his wife's advice and praying that these wicked people should repent and they return to God. That is, up until that final moment, as long as there is life, there is hope. We ourselves are summoned to return to God, and we continue to pray for all those who are still God's backsliding children to return home as well. We move on to the second question. Can a sinner whose sins condemn him to death still attain salvation? Does the Bible tell us what happens to such a sinner when he dies? Is there such a punishment as eternal damnation? When is someone subjected to such a fate? And of course, inevitably here too, we need to consider the implications of a number of passages in the Bible. First, Numbers chapter 15 Verses 30 and 31. Now, admittedly, I could have selected a number of other passages in the Bible that speak of this punishment as well. So I'm using it more as a kind of general envelope to encompass similar statements that we find from Leviticus and on. The soul that does aught with a high hand, whether he be homeborn or proselyte, the same blasphemes God. And that soul shall be cut off from among his people, because he has despised the word of God and has broken his commandment. That soul shall utterly be cut off, his iniquity shall be upon him. In Hebrew, this punishment is karet. Karet, again, being cut off. In the Hebrew of verse 31, hikaret, hikaret, that soul shall indeed utterly be cut off. Inevitably, we need to ask ourselves, what is this punishment of the soul being cut off? And the truth is there's inevitably more than one possibility. There's more than one possibility that we find in our traditions, and Perhaps we should more crucially appreciate there's more than one possibility of the trajectory of the life of the sinner. That is, on the one hand, when we read in Psalm 16, verses 9 and 10, Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoices, my flesh also dwells in safety. For you will not abandon my soul to the netherworld, neither will you suffer your godly one to see the pit. On the one hand, these verses speak of the reward of the righteous. And as we read in verse 11, you make me to know the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy, in your right hand bliss forevermore. But there is, on the other hand, the punishment of the wicked. That is, you will not abandon my soul to see the netherworld, but there is a netherworld. You will not suffer your godly one to see the pit, but there is a pit. And, indeed, in that vein, when we consider the promise of reward to the righteous, as expressed likewise in Psalm 31, verse 20, Oh, how abundant is your goodness, which you have laid up for them that fear you. The wicked... By contrast, don't experience that. That is, as we see it expressed in Psalm 49, in verse 13, and again in verse 21, 
But man abides not in honor. He is like the beasts that perish or that are silenced. Verse 21, man is, that is in honor understands not. Again, he is like the beasts that perish or are silenced. There are human beings who live their lives like animals. By which I mean simply, we each come into the world as physical beings, the baby is a physical being, with a spiritual potential. The challenge that God gives each and every one of us is to actualize that spiritual potential. And thus, by actualizing it, to become spiritual beings. Now, if one in life remains only a physical being, then in the most literal sense, one is living like an animal. An animal comes into the world as a physical being, it remains a physical being, and it dies as a physical being. And what happens to the animal after its death? As we read in Ecclesiastes, the life spirit of the beast settles upon the ground as it was. There isn't anything abiding of everlasting spiritual content. And since there is not, the beasts that perish simply perish. We could express this in more rigorous physical terms. The second law of thermodynamics dictates that entropy increases, that physical things fall apart. Physical things fall apart, your car gets run down, your clothes wear out, your body decays. All physical things are subject to the second law of thermodynamics. But if you've made yourself into something spiritual, then you're not merely physical, and that isn't subject to physical laws such as the laws of thermodynamics. So, when an individual lives his life merely physically, like an animal, then the promise is that we read, for example, in the Psalms regarding those who are indeed vouchsafed the spiritual bliss of the hereafter just don't apply. That is one course, one possibility. But simultaneously, we also recognize there's another far more frightening possibility. So far, we've spoken about individuals who just miss the opportunity in the sense that they came into the world as physical beings, they remain physical beings. And since they remain physical beings without any abiding spiritual content, when they die, they die. What about individuals who really do actualize something metaphysical, something beyond the physical? But that something is evil. That something is wicked. That's not merely physical. That's a bankrupt spirituality. A bankrupt spirituality is also not subject to mere physical laws that would dictate that at the end of life it simply ceases to exist. A bankrupt spirituality goes on forever. And it's in this vein that we can understand the words of Abigail to King David in the first book of Samuel, in chapter 25, verse 29. The soul of my Lord, she says, referring to David, shall be bound up in the bundle of life with God your Lord. That's everlasting life. And the souls of your enemies, them shall he sling out as from the hollow of a sling. Now, of course, we don't really understand what that means in any kind of a literal sense. But this notion of slung out 
from the hollow of a sling implies being shut into oblivion. A sense of relentless falling. A sense of everlasting torment. We see that idea expressed with the metaphor of fire in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 33. A hearth is ordered of old. Yea, for the king it is prepared deep and large. The pile thereof is fire and much wood. The breath of God, like a stream of brimstone, burns therein. And of course, perhaps best known, the final words of the prophet Isaiah at the end of chapter 66. So on the one hand, with respect to the righteous, it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to prostrate themselves before me, says God. Verse 24, the final verse of Isaiah, and they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have rebelled against me. For their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. A worm that doesn't die. But worms are physical. This obviously is not physical. Neither this decay nor this fire should be construed as mere physical things. This is, quite literally, eternal damnation. We see this not only in the previous passages, we see this described likewise in Ezekiel chapter 32, when Ezekiel speaks of the punishment for Egypt. In chapter 32, verse 18, Well, for the multitude of Egypt, and cast them down, even her with the daughters of the mighty nations, unto the nether parts of the earth, with them that go down into the pit. In verse 20, They shall fall in the midst of them that are slain by the sword. She is delivered to the sword. Draw her down and all her multitudes. And finally, in verse 23, referring to Assyria, once again, whose graves are set in the uttermost parts of the pit, and her company is round about her grave, all of them slain and fallen by the sword. This, too, is a metaphor, a description in physical terms of the nether parts of the earth, the pit, a relentless, indeed, endless, falling. And similarly, in Psalm 55, in verse 24, referring to the wicked, but you, O God, will bring them down into the nethermost pit. And indeed, this is eternal damnation. People who are mere animals are simply physical beings. People who are rather monsters who have dedicated themselves to a bankrupt spirituality will continue to experience the consequences of the course of bankruptcy that they have embraced forever. So yes, that is eternal damnation. And as such, returning to our question, that um, once that happens, then um, when we speak of what happens to the sinner when he dies, um, we don't really understand, of course, what that means, because it's a level of spiritual torment that far exceeds the parameters of what we could possibly attempt to fathom in this physical world. But there is simultaneously one additional dimension that needs to be stressed, and that is, can a sinner whose sins condemn him to death still attain salvation? Which brings me to one final passage, Isaiah chapter 22. Verses 12, 13, and 14. In that day did God, the God of hosts, call to weeping and to lamentation and to boldness and to girding with sackcloth. And behold, joy and gladness, slaying oxen, and slaughtering sheep, eating flesh, and drinking wine, and 
here we read in the words of Isaiah, the slogan of hedonistic societies to this day, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we shall die. Verse 14. And the God of hosts revealed himself in my ears. Surely this iniquity shall not be atoned for till you die, says the Lord God of hosts. Shall not be atoned for till you die. So, of course, inevitably, we consider in this light that a sinner whose sins condemn him to death still attain salvation. And I must share with you, very much apropos, especially, of the verses that we discussed earlier today in Ezekiel chapter 3 and chapter 18 and chapter 33, that in our tradition, the meaning of this verse, again, Isaiah chapter 22, verse 14, is not that since this iniquity shall not be atoned for till you die, that means that your eternal punishment is a foregone conclusion, but rather that there are sins, the most severe sins, for which there may indeed be no complete atonement possible in this world. There can be sins in which, even with earnest repentance, full forgiveness in this world is impossible. But, you know, with such individuals, we'll still say, this iniquity shall not be atoned for till you die. But when you die, if you repent it sincerely, it is atoned for. And indeed, in our tradition, there is absolutely no crime that will in any way blemish in the hereafter someone who in this world has sincerely transformed him or herself by repenting, by returning home to God. It continues to be in our hands. Again, except for those individuals who have already died without repentance. But so long as you're alive, as long as there is life, there is hope. And we always have that opportunity to return to God. And He is always waiting for us to return to Him. So, even with respect to what at first brush strikes us as such a terrifying verse, our response, and I reiterate, it's a response that is pretty much escapable, given that what we saw in Ezekiel, is, it shall not be atoned for till you die, but if you sincerely repent, if you sincerely repent, even the worst crimes can be atoned in death. Even in the individual who is condemned to death for having committed a capital crime is urged by the court to, before execution, confess his sins and pray to God that his death should be an atonement for them. And we believe that if he does sincerely, then his death will be an atonement. And ultimately, he will be saved in God through his sincere repentance. Even though in this world, the punishment may be an inescapable one. That completes our discussion of the second question here. The third question demands of us considering some additional motifs in evaluating where all this leads in our understanding through the Bible of our relationship with God and forgiveness. What is atonement in the Bible? And how does it relate to forgiveness? That is, when the first and second temples in Jerusalem were destroyed, ostensibly, of course, the opportunity for atonement through the services and temples was lost. So what 
consequences did their destructions have on attaining atonement and forgiveness? So, of course, inevitably, in order to understand what the answer to this question is, we need to consider what atonement means and how it appears in the Bible. Atonement, kipurim, is, of course, a concept that in our perceptions of the Bible is most directly associated with the day of atonement, Yom HaKippurim. And perhaps that's a good place to start. In Leviticus chapter 16, we read of the temple service on Yom HaKippurim, on the day of atonement. And then by way of summation, we read in verses 30 and on, For on this day shall atonement be made for you to purify you from all your sins, you shall be purified before God. And the theme is recurrent with respect to atonement. In verse 32, the priest who shall be anointed and who shall be consecrated to be priest in his father's stead shall make the atonement and shall put on the linen garments, even the holy garments. Verse 33, and he shall make atonement for the most holy place and he shall make atonement for the tent of meeting and for the altar. And he shall make atonement for the priests and for all the people of the assembly. Verse 34. And this shall be an everlasting statute unto you to make atonement for the children of Israel because of all their sins once in the year. Now, one of the challenges to understand what this means in practice is considering how this notion of atonement relates to forgiveness. And admittedly, in Leviticus chapter 16, in considering the service on the Day of Atonement, we don't actually encounter the verb forgiving. But we do, repeatedly, from Leviticus chapter 4 and on, when we reach about, read about the sacrificial service in the temple. So as a case in point, in verse 13, If the whole congregation of Israel shall err, the thing being hid from the eyes of the assembly, and do any of the things that God has commanded not to be done and are guilty. So then there's a description of the pursuant service in the tabernacle, in the temple. And the conclusion in verse 20, thus shall he, the priest, do with the bullock, as he did with the bullock of the sin offering, so shall he do with this, and the priest shall make atonement for them and they shall be forgiven. Atonement, forgiveness. There seems to be a connection here, isn't there? Likewise, in Numbers chapter 15, we considered another passage from Numbers chapter 15 earlier. Here, from verse 22 and on, and if you shall err and not perform all these commandments that God has spoken unto Moses, then there is once again a prescription of a specific service that takes place in the tabernacle, in the temple. And by way of conclusion, we read in verse 25, the priest shall make atonement for all the congregation of the children of Israel, and they shall be forgiven, for it was an error. And they have brought their offering, an offering made by fire unto God, and their sin offering before God for their error. In verse 26, and all the congregation of the children of Israel shall be forgiven. And the stranger that sojourns among them, for in respect of all the people, it was done in error. So, of course, one point that we should note at the outset, and indeed this is true in nearly all of the services that are prescribed in the tabernacle and temple for atonement, is we are describing what happens when a sin was committed unintentionally, inadvertently. But still and all, the question that needs to be considered is, what does this atonement mean, and how does it pertain to the forgiveness? So the first point for us to consider is, if you will, a linguist one. The root of atonement, we've noted in the past that every biblical word ultimately derives from a three-letter root, is kiper in the first instance in which we encounter this verb, it has nothing at all to do with atonement. It is rather in Genesis chapter 6, in verse 14, 
when we read pertaining to the ark that God bids Noah to make, that you shall pitch it within and without with pitch, which really means you shall cover the wood with some kind of a covering. And that really, most essentially, is what kofer, lechaper, means. Covering over. In much the same vein, the second instance in which we encounter this root in the Bible, which also has nothing to do with atonement, is when Jacob sends a lavish gift to Esau. And the reason for his doing so is described in the Bible in Genesis chapter 32, verse 21, as, well, we would translate this as, I will appease him with the present that goes before me. And after all, I will steal his face, perhaps eventually he will accept me. But I will appease him, literally in the Hebrew means, I will cover over his face in the sense of his angry face, his face of wrath, by sending him this lavish gift. So atonement signifies covering something over. And of course, inevitably, in this vein, we need to consider what the purpose of atonement is as it relates to forgiveness. Because, again, on the one hand, we do find atonement as a mechanism for the attainment of the forgiveness stipulated in the temple service. But on the other hand, we've certainly seen enough examples heretofore today to realize that forgiveness in and of itself doesn't depend upon atonement. Now the truth is that there are on manifold planes, and we've discussed this in the past, many passages in the prophets that seem practically to cast dispersions on the value of the sacrificial service in the temple altogether. That is, beginning with the prophet Samuel, who says to King Saul in the first book of Samuel, chapter 15, verse 22, has God as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in hearkening to the voice of God? Behold, to hearken is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the fat of rams. And in Isaiah chapter 1, of course, we read far, far more definitively the objection to the sacrificial service. Beginning in verse 11, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams, and so on and so forth. And indeed, prophet says in God's name, bring no more vain oblations. It is an offering of abomination unto me. This same theme appears in Jeremiah as well. In Jeremiah chapter 6, to what purpose is to me the frankincense that comes from Sheba and the good cane from a far land? Your burnt offerings are not acceptable, nor your sacrifices pleasing to me. In Jeremiah chapter 7, in Verses 21 and 22, even more stridently, add your burnt offerings to your sacrifices and eat flesh. If you want to have a good barbecue, don't do it on my account. For I spoke not unto your fathers, nor commanded them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings or, or sacrifices. What I commanded them to do, what I commanded them to do was hearken unto my voice, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people, and walk you in all the way that I command you, that it may be well with you. And similarly, in Hosea, in chapter 6, I desire kindness and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God, rather than burnt offerings. In chapter 8, in verse 13, as for the sacrifices that are made by fire unto me, let them slaughter flesh and eat it, much as Jeremiah expressed it. I'm not interested in these offerings at all. For Israel has forgotten his maker, built temples, Judah has multiplied fortified cities, I will send the fire upon the cities. It's over. In Amos chapter 5 from verse 21 and on, likewise, I hate, I despise your feasts, and I will take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your meal offerings, I will not accept them, neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. Forget it, take them away. And, of course, perhaps most famously, in the words of the prophet Micha in chapter 6, when people ask the question, shall I come before him, before God, with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? And 
will God be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousand of rivers of oil? The response of the prophet is, it has been told you, O man, what is good and what God requires of you. But to do justly, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. But if you're not doing that, forget it. And as the last of the prophets, Malachi, expresses it in chapter 1, verse 10, Oh, that there were even one among you that would shut the doors, shut the doors of the temple, that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says God, the Lord of hosts, neither will I accept an offering at your hand. And likewise, in the Holy Writings, in the Psalms, we read repeatedly sacrifice and meal offering in Psalm 40, verse 7, you have no delight in. Burnt offering and sin offering, you have not required. In Psalm 51, you delight not in sacrifice, verse 18, you have no pleasure in burnt offerings. In Psalm 69, and it shall please God better than a bullock that has horns and hoofs, in verse 32, that is, what pleases God more is praising the name of God with a song and magnifying him with thanksgiving. And in the book of Proverbs, likewise, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to, the, to God in chapter 15, verse 8. To do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to, to God than sacrifice in chapter 21, verse 3. And in verse 27, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination. And finally, one last example from Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 17. Guard your foot when you go to the house of God and be ready to hearken is better than when fools give sacrifices, for they know not that they do evil. So, of course, all these passages, we've noted them in the past in our discussions of Isaiah, seem to be a very dim view of sacrifice. You might almost conclude that the verdict of the prophets is anti-sacrifice. And it's important for us to bear in mind that that conclusion would certainly not be justified. That is, just consider the same Isaiah, who in chapter 1 decries the offerings that are being brought into the temple. In his vision of the future, in Isaiah chapter 56, in verses 6 and 7, speaks of the aliens who join themselves to God to minister unto him and to love the name of God, to be his servants. Verse 7, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be acceptable upon my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. But note that in that exalted vision of the future, there are the burnt offerings and the sacrifices upon God's holy altar. This is the same Isaiah who, in chapter 1, decried the sacrificial service. But of course, this shouldn't surprise us. It shouldn't surprise us because God doesn't change his mind. As expressed in Numbers chapter 23, verse 19, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. These were the words of Bilam. And likewise, the words of the prophet Samuel in the first book of Samuel, chapter 15, verse 29, the glory of Israel will not lie nor repent. So that which is enshrined in the holy words of the Bible, in particular in Leviticus, can never be struck away. And indeed, in that regard, we would do well to consider the definitive message of Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 28. The hidden things belong to God our Lord, but the things that are revealed, everything that God has given us, as an operative mandate, they belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this Torah. All the words of the Torah are indeed forever. So, trying to integrate everything that we've seen at this point, we inevitably ask the question, why is atonement, in its relationship to forgiveness, it seems to be very much embedded in the sacrificial service, and how altogether are we relating to the sacrificial service? And of course, finally, most definitively, how do we attain 
forgiveness in the absence of the temple service? And what about atonement? What is the purpose of atonement altogether? So with respect to these various questions, there are, of course, inevitably a number of dimensions that should be borne in mind. The first, one that brings us back once again to Hosea chapter 14. And we said we would return to this passage in Hosea earlier today as something that was designated for the end of today's session. We're there now. In chapter 14, verse 2, Return, O Israel, unto God your Lord, for you have stumbled in your iniquity. Take with you words and return to God. Say unto him, Forgive all iniquity and accept that which is good. So we will render for bullocks the offering of our lips. We don't have the opportunity to bring bullocks. We don't have the holy temple or the altar within it. The services that took place in the temple are obviously off-limits to us. But the prophet Hosea tells us as an essential principle that we have an alternative to render for bullocks the offering of our lips. Will it work? God promises. In verse 5, I will hear the backslidings. I will love them freely, for my anger is turned away from him. And of course, inevitably then, what we need to consider is what altogether the role of atonement is. There is the possibility that we would deem atonement to be a, uh, a very basic level in the attainment of forgiveness, if you will, a kind of simple shortcut that applies via the temple service at a baseline of functioning. But forgiveness, of course, inevitably, is a far more sublime enterprise that doesn't require the atonement that takes place through the temple service, there is an alternative possibility. Perhaps atonement signifies something that we do to express a renewed, intensive bond to God that may only be accessible in its fullest most sublime sense once the temple is restored. But in either case, either interpretation, neither atonement nor forgiveness hinge exclusively upon a particular ritual, a particular service that takes place in the temple. How do I know this? In the first book of Samuel, in chapter 3, we read of the dire prophecy of doom to the priestly clan of Eli. And in verse 14, there is an oath, terrifying oath. Therefore I have sworn unto the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for with sacrifice nor offering forever. Now, of course, one could conceivably read those words as implying that there's no opportunity for atonement whatsoever. In our tradition, that's not what it means. In our tradition, this is a definitive statement that whatever atonement you seek to attain will not be via the sacrificial service. How can you attain atonement? Well, let's consider some other verses. In Psalm 65, in verse 4, the tale of iniquities has overcome me. As for our transgressions, you will atone for them. You, God. In Psalm 78, verse 38, but he, God, being full of compassion, atones for iniquity and destroys not. In Psalm 79, verse 9, Help us, O God, of our salvation for the sake of the glory of your name and deliver us and atone for our sins, for your name's sake. Atonement comes from God. Now, if you ask, is atonement any kind of carte blanche that God bestows? Here, once again, I feel compelled to say no. And this is perhaps most aptly expressed in Proverbs Chapter 16, verse 6, 
by kindness and truth, iniquity is atoned for. So you do the kindness, you do the truth, the truth of Torah, and you will attain atonement. You don't need the sacrificial service. It is indeed a mechanism that God bestowed that we believe he will yet bestow again in the restoration of the Holy Temple. But atonement is attained first and foremost from God, not through some specific mechanism in which we engage. Besides, of course, the obvious, which is our faithfully returning to God. And it is precisely in this vein of faithfully returning to God that we recognize that both atonement and forgiveness depend first and foremost on that most critical foundation that we noted at the outset, and that is repentance. And on that note, we conclude. Because, of course, inevitably returning to Ezekiel chapter 18 and Ezekiel chapter 33, we see this relentlessly. Ezekiel doesn't speak once about the temple service, nor, for that matter, does he speak of atonement as a condition for forgiveness. Rather, again, let's just recall, in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 21, if the wicked returns from all his sins that he has committed and keeps all my statutes and does justice and righteousness, he shall surely live. He shall not die. Verse 23, have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, says God the Lord, and not rather that he should return from his ways and live. And likewise, in describing the wicked man in verse 27, that when the wicked man turns away from his wickedness that he has committed and does justice and righteousness, he shall save his soul alive. There's no additional requirement. He shall save his soul alive. Verse 32, once again. For I have no pleasure in the death of him who dies, says God the Lord. Wherefore, return yourselves and live. And of course, so too, in Ezekiel chapter 33, in verse 11, say unto them once again, as I live, says God the Lord, this is a divine oath. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked return from his way and live. Return you, return you from your evil ways, and why will you die, O house of Israel? In verse 12, and you, son of man, say unto the children of your people, the righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression, and as for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not stumble thereby in the day that he returns for his wickedness. Neither shall he that is righteous be able to live thereby in the day that he sins. No talk of a condition of anything else, anyone else. No atonement by any other means. It's up to you. You return to God. And when you do, indeed, we read in Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 19, and on this note we conclude. When the wicked returns from his wickedness and does justice and righteousness, he shall live thereby. It's God's promise. He swore. He swore that it's in our hands because he's put it there. And he swore that when we return to God, he welcomes us. And so, just concluding, when we ask ourselves, about atonement and forgiveness. So indeed, atonement is a covering over of the sin, of the blemish, of whatever it is that has come between us and God. And it is a gift that God bestows upon us. And part of that gift was the empowerment that comes from the temple service when we are worthy, when the world is worthy of having the temple standing. Then there's a straightforward pathway that leads to the attainment of atonement through the temple service. We don't have that today. But that doesn't prevent us from soliciting God's atonement and God's forgiveness and God's blessings.
because the greatest blessing is the free will that he has granted us. No matter what, even at the crushing point, even at the moment of death, to return to God, to return home, to return to his blessings. God bless you.